community leaders spanning from coast to coast throughout the country. We are particularly proud of our growing voice among the military community, of which you are a critical part. Uh, we have a National Security Advisory Council that's comprised of over 200 retired three and four star general and flag officers. Uh, that group is co-chaired by uh, Admiral James Stavridis and General Tony Zinni uh, and our Veterans for Smart Power Network, which I oversee along with my colleague Gretchen Klingler, uh, is made up of over 30,000 veterans from around the country uh, who remain committed to strengthening all of America's tools of national security, development, diplomacy, alongside a strong defense to keep us safe. Now, what brings this diverse cross-section of America together is a firm belief in America's global leadership, that American aid, strategic investments in development and diplomacy are essential to protecting our national security, advancing our economic interests, and projecting the best of American values, and that our engagement overseas matters to American families here at home. In DC, we advocate for a small piece of the federal budget known as the International Affairs Budget. Uh, this budget supports our diplomats, our embassies, and our development programs, and has a huge return on investment. For just 1% of the federal budget, it's a penny on every dollar, we can support efforts to battle the root causes of violent extremism and instability in other countries, respond to humanitarian disasters, and tackle pandemics like COVID-19, and prevent future outbreaks through strengthening global health. Around the country, we bring together our unique coalition to give voice to these issues around the country, urging members of Congress to support and protect the international affairs budget. We know the US can't do this alone. We need to act as a global leader by working with our friends and allies around the world to solve global problems before they reach our shores. At this time, I'd like to invite John Conger, Director Emeritus of the Center for Climate and Security and a former colleague of USGLC's Executive Director, Jason Gross, so all in the family here. Uh, and he's gonna deliver some brief remarks and introduce Congressman Peters. John? Thanks, uh, Sean, for the opportunity to be here this evening and to introduce our featured guest. Uh, my name is John Conger, and I'm the Director Emeritus of the Center for Climate and Security. We're a small Washington-based think tank focused on highlighting the intersection of climate change and national security and advocating for commensurate action. At uh, CCS, we often approach this issue from a military perspective, and DOD has truly been a leader in the climate space, focusing both on adaptation and emissions reductions. I had the honor of leading these efforts during the Obama administration uh, from, at, at the Pentagon, uh, but I think DOD's importance was even more critical in the subsequent administration, counterbalancing significant climate skepticism in the White House with a pragmatic recognition that climate change has very real impacts on our security environment. Impacts uh, we'd be unwise to ignore. That said, the roles of both state and USAID in this space cannot be, well, uh, overstated. Uh, the climate change is a driver of instability around the world. It is opening up regions like the Arctic, even as it drives people out of their homelands in Central America and Africa, in the Middle East and Asia. So it, in so many ways it is changing the strategic environment an environment in which our diplomats and development experts must operate, and it must inform their actions and their strategies going forward. So in that context, I appreciate the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition's event, and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing Congressman Peters' remarks on climate change, national security, and the critical importance of incorporating it into our diplomatic strategies and development programs. So let me take a moment to introduce our special guest. Congressman Scott Peters represents San Diego and California's 52nd Congressional District. He is truly an expert on climate change, working earlier in his career as an economist for the EPA and as an environmental attorney. He was elected to the San Diego City Council in 2000 and began serving the citizens of San Diego in Congress in 2013. He serves on both the Budget Committee and the Energy and Commerce Committee. He's a member of the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus and is co-chair of the Congressional Special Operations Forces uh, Caucus. So at CCS, we know his work well, and he was kind enough to speak to a CCS event in San Diego several years ago, focused on the implications of climate change for the military installations in his district and around the San Diego region. Most important for this group, however, I should note that Congressman Peters has been a true champion for US leadership and has supported legislation to strengthen development, 
and diplomacy programs. So Congressman, thank you for joining us today and for your continued support for US global leadership. Sean, uh, back to you for your discussion with the Congressman. John, thank you so much for that introduction. And Congressman Peters, uh, again, wanna thank you for your time here today. Uh, really looking forward to this discussion. So before we dive in here, uh, I would be remiss, of course, if we didn't touch on what's happening in Ukraine. For the past three weeks, all eyes have been on Eastern Europe. And many of you tuning in here today have served in the region or have friends or family that have been impacted. All of us stand with Ukraine and stand against the unprovoked horror that's been brought to the country from President Putin. USGLC will continue to facilitate dialogue around Ukraine and the humanitarian crisis unfolding before our eyes, but uh, we're here today to talk about the intersection of climate change and national security. And I wanna start by discussing this intersection broadly, how it relates to humanitarian crises around the world, the implications of climate change for our national security at home, and then inviting some of our veterans and advisory committee members from around the country to weigh in as well. So Congressman Peters, um, you know, climate change continues to be one of the greatest challenges facing the world right now. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's alarming report found that floods and other extreme weather events displaced more than 13 million people across Asia and Africa alone in 2019. Uh, moreover, half the world's population currently faces severe water scarcity at least part of the year, and that's really just scratching the surface here. So can you please uh, speak to the connection between climate change and national security, help us understand that a little better, and what is the unique role that international development and diplomacy can play in addressing climate change's impact on national security? Thanks, Sean, and thanks, uh, thanks John, uh, for, for having me. Um, uh, I'll first say uh, that this is, a, this is an issue of, of great importance to me. I, I, I think John mentioned our, um, my uh, environmental background, but of course I represent San Diego. I have seven military facilities in my district, uh, Marines, Navy, and Coast Guard. Uh, we have 230,000 veterans, I think, in the county, probably one of the largest populations uh, of veterans. And so um, this connection is really important. Let me just say basically three ways I think um, national security and climate are connected. First is what you're seeing right playing out right now uh, in, in Ukraine and the fallout from Ukraine for us, which first of all is a, um, it is a outrageous and heartbreaking event. Uh, and it's far from settled in any way, but I, I do appreciate the Biden administration bringing the, the world together in a multilateral way to respond to this. I think, I think it's the most appropriate course, but it certainly has laid bare our dependence on fossil fuels and also reminds us that fossil fuels don't always come from friendly places. They come from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Venezuela, Russia. Um, and the, you know, there's an imperative for climate for us to, um, to, to move away from these uh, fuels that generate greenhouse gases, but it's also a national security imperative for us to get true independence. And, and this is a worldwide commodity. Uh, you see what happens to the supply um, when, the, when the supply chain is disrupted. Um, and um, I think we should redouble our efforts to be moving toward renewables. I think I would include nuclear, hydro, um, you know, anything that could get us more freedom from, from these, um, these particular sources of of, uh, of energy, you know, because as long as we're dependent on them, I think there's a lot of leverage against us that the world has in bad ways. Um, second, I think someone was hinting at this before, um, the last quadrennial defense review in 2014 called out the pressures um, caused by climate change that aggravate um, threats to the country and to the world, uh, particularly mass migration that's gonna happen, uh, poverty, a political instability that fuels violence. I think many people have concluded that what's happened in Syria is a result of, of drought in many ways. Um, those kinds of things are gonna pop up in a lot of places. And um, you know, we were told when I was on the Armed Services Committee in my first two terms, that that, that kind of thing is really gonna require us to, to, um, uh, you know, to, be, to respond with bigger military budgets. And so, I think that that certainly is going to be true for diplomacy as well. How are you going to work out what happens with rising seas and with um, with farmland that's no longer functionally farmland? 
Um, the thing I'd also mention too is, is that the one thing I appreciate about the military is the response that they've made in terms of renewable energy. And if you ask me the one place where we're really, really seeing innovation in the, in the federal government in renewable energy, it's the military. Um, when I was uh, on the Armed Services Committee, Ray Mabus, Secretary of the Navy, uh, he launched the Great Green, Great Green Fleet. Um, I, I think I, launched a I helped launch a ship out of Coronado that uh, was powered by biofuels from beef fat. I said, so my wife had to let me eat a steak that week because I thought it was patriotic to do that. Uh, but all sorts of different ways of fueling, um, fueling um, uh, ships have been what the Navy's done all along. It went from sails to, to coal to, uh, to, to nuclear. Uh, that was all Navy innovation. And that continues today. Uh, they have ships that are uh, hybrids that sort of run on electric to a certain, to a certain um, speed and then over that on conventional fuels. Um, and, you know, when I talked to the, the commandant back then, General Amos, he sat down for his meeting with me and he said to me, he said, Scott, he said, I want to talk to you about solar energy. Well, what was it about solar energy that, that um, he thought was, was related to national security? He explained to me that one of the most dangerous things we did in the military was move large amounts of petroleum from one place to another. And when those convoys were attacked, uh, we lost soldiers and Marines. So because there's a business case for it, the Marines and the Navy uh, and the military is, is taking a real hand at uh, innovating. And the other thing that's happening in my district at the Marine Corps Air Station Miramar is the development of a microgrid that um, can make that base totally self energy uh, independent, energy self-sufficient, and can help the local utility in times of, um, of, of um, you know, blackouts and, and, and shortages. So the, the military recognizes it, it they, they get this. Um, the, we have to make sure we cut through the politics and make sure that we're responding in a way that's, that's clear headed. I think, the, I think that the, um, the conditions in Ukraine right now are, are those kinds of things. And I would say, I'm not, this is a really long answer, I'm sorry to do this, but you know, a foreign policy around energy is something that's really important. I, I think that one of the things that keeps me up at night is all the cheap coal in India. And if that comes out of the ground, I mean, we're going to have a big battle. So we need to, we need the rest of the world to help, help the rest of the world through diplomacy develop in ways that will mitigate the effects of climate change. And I think um, indirectly, but certainly uh, mitigate these security risks as well. Thanks, Congressman. And you, you, you really nailed it. I'm glad you brought up the, the Great Green Fleet. And you know, the combatant commanders have been talking about this um, at least as early as 2012, uh, right. early or even earlier than that. And, uh, you know, having served in the Marine Corps myself um, from 2004 to 2008, you know, I know that a lot, you know, as you alluded to, of, of the casualties that we had in Iraq and Afghanistan around that time came from ambushes on fuel convoys. That's yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, but, you know, in terms of climate change, even back here on our own shores, uh, in terms of, of the military and our force readiness, uh, we're affected here, too. You know, as you as you alluded to with all the bases that you have uh, in your district, you know better than anyone. Uh, you know, this is not just something that's affecting other countries. Uh, it's happening right here at home. Uh, I mean, the mega drought gripping the American West has generated the driest two decades in the region uh, in the last 1200 years. And, uh, you know, human caused climate change has fueled that problem. Uh, defense officials in 2019 reported that eight military bases in California uh, are particularly threatened by climate change, at least two of them uh, your, in, in your district, uh, Naval Base San Diego, Coronado as well. Right. And, uh, you know, just, how can we better communicate these risks um, and, and explain that to folks that, that we have these challenges here at home, not just to people's homes, but also to our bases. I'm from Tampa, Florida. We have, you know, SOCOM and SOUTHCOM. Uh, and CENTCOM right, right there in Tampa, it's at risk. So what, what do you see as the consequences of not taking action on climate change? To address well, in terms of communicating, I think, I, I think a lot about that because, you know, I, I know I mentioned it, I'm a Democrat, um, but, and I think that our party is, is leading on climate action, but I don't think that this country can solve any big problem with one political party alone. Uh, we didn't, we've never won a world war that way. We've never sent anyone to the moon that way. We've never beat a pandemic that way. We need everybody in this game. And I, I would say that um, who are the trusted communicators? The military is still probably the most trusted institution uh, in the country. And when those generals and admirals get up to a committee and they explain that these are, these are real challenges, 
Um, you know, they're not they're not doing it because they're tree huggers and everybody knows they're doing it because it's a national security issue. So I just would really encourage that to continue. Uh, in my own work, I've been really reaching out to Republicans. I work, you know, particularly, particularly interested in uh, methane emissions. I think it happens to be the low hanging fruit of climate action because 25 percent of of global warming to warming today is 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 attributable to methane largely from oil and gas leaks. Um, and um, if we could, because it doesn't persist in the atmosphere, if we could get it out of the mix, we could really slow the rate of climate change if we do something about methane. It also happens that customers for liquefied natural gas coming out of Texas want cleaner liquefied natural gas. So France actually canceled a contract from Brownsville because they thought it was dirty. So I've been going to Texas and make this case myself to people who are generally um, quite Republican and, and obviously literally invested in the legacy extraction industries to tell them, look, if we're not going to ban oil and gas, which I'm not proposing, um, I think that that's a long term uh, issue. But for now, you got to clean up your act and, and let's figure out a way to do that that makes sense for you in the industry. The, and the other the other place to look is to is around values. And I'll tell you that the largest, the, the fastest growing group of climate voters are young evangelical Christians. They are not as concerned about polar bears. They're not as concerned about statistics. They're concerned about the God, God's creation for their children and their grandchildren. And we need to meet them on that level. Um, there's, a, there's a group called the Evangelical Environmental Network run by a guy named Mitch Hescox, who's got um, quite a list. He's trying to get evangelicals in the room when he comes to meet with me. We don't talk about uh, reproductive freedom. We don't talk about um, whether LGBT uh, folks should be married, but we can agree on climate change. Um, there's a very, very important climate scientist in Lubbock, Texas. She teaches at Texas Tech. Her name is Catherine Hayho. You may have seen her in the New York Times interview recently. She's an evangelical Christian. She gets offers all the time to go to the East Coast. She says, no, we got to do this work in Texas. And um, I think that talk, the way she talks about it is around values and around making sure that we have a world that's livable and better for our children and our grandchildren. I, I think some of us who think more in terms of statistics and uh, for whom, you know, I, that's kind of how I think more analytical. I have to keep that in mind as well, that you have to appeal to people's, to, to what matters to them. And uh, that's how we're going to expand this, this, um, the, the interest in this issue and the action, I think, the viability of action over time. That's food for thought. Thank you for that advice. Um, shifting back internationally, uh, you know, with climate change set to push 132 million people into poverty this decade, uh, and to displace over 1 billion people by 2050. And low-income nations are disproportionately enduring the destructive effects of changing weather patterns. Uh, we're already seeing the immediate humanitarian and economic impacts of increasingly severe and frequent floods, droughts, wildfires, storms. Yep. You know, as, as climate change continues to fuel humanitarian crises all over the world, from, from res refugee crises to feud in insecurity, now, how do you anticipate that's going to impact the United States national security and global tensions in terms of geopolitics? Yeah, I mean, it's going to exacerbate the, the, um, the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots. I mean, I think in many ways, the United States will have resources to deal with resiliency and, and uh, mitigation or adaptation. Uh, but, um, you know, it's going to, like, I, I think, again, like, in terms of diplomacy, you know, we, we often make the argument that we should be thinking of that as part of our national security strategy. It's not just about the military budget. you got to fund the State Department. And we're going to have to think about climate outreach that way, too. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of reasons we need to lead in this country. Often, you know, my Republican counterparts um, will point out, and they're absolutely right, that, you know, the United States is only 10 percent of emissions. If only we act on it, um, uh, you know, it's not going to solve the problem. Well, that's exactly right. But why, why should other people... Why should we lead, right? The two reasons we should lead, one is very is sort of like economic and Machiavellian, is we should invent the stuff that's gonna make the change so we can make money off it. We should innovate here in the United States for economic reasons. But the other thing is we need to show people who aspire to have our lifestyle, which is based on oil and gas, that no, it's that we, we can live a, a wonderful first world lifestyle, a United States lifestyle um, without this total reliance on, on, uh, on fossil fuels. If we can demonstrate that to the rest of the world, then, then their desire to be us 
uh, can, can incorporate more climate sensitivity and, and better, uh, better development around power. But like I said, too, it really calls on us to be thinking aggressively about how the rest of the world is going to, is going to pursue economic development. We can't tell India that they can't develop. We can tell them, let's use small nuclear module reactors. Let's use, um, let's use uh, uh, renewables where we can. Let's figure out how to way to get you, you know, wind or offshore wind. Um, that's the kind of thing that, that should be part of our foreign policy outreach. China is investing all over the world. China is investing in, um, in its, um, its Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the United States needs to be out there too. And it's, um, it's something we can do in, in conjunction with uh, private investment as well. But, but it's something we have, to, we have to be aggressive about it as part of our diplomacy, I think. Thank you. And uh, at this point, uh, I think we have some questions from folks uh, who are watching. Um, so we're going to call some folks up on screen here and uh, see if they have uh, some questions for us. So we've invited two. Um, our, our first question is going to come from Wayne Trimmer. Uh, Wayne, who I've known for some time, joining us from Texas, which has already been invoked in this discussion. Yeah. So, uh wayne uh good to see you and yeah, good to see you. happy st patrick's day so go ahead and uh and ask your question congressman. tell me where you're from in texas wayne <laughs> well congressman i'm from dallas and okay. um i've been here about 30 years after i got off active duty in the marine corps but i must tell you i, I visit your district probably a couple times a year and i've run tory pines down to the water probably a hundred times, maybe a not a lot of Texans, a lot of Texans in the summertime. We, a lot of Texans in the summertime. We, we love them. Friends. Yeah. They own homes in yeah, yeah. La Jolla, or as we say here, La Jolla, but yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Well, um, you touched on a lot of uh, what I was going to ask, but you know, global um, um, climate change is just that it's global. So the, the fact um, that we have domestic policy, that's great. And, we need to make sure that our allies and friends and partners are on board. So my, my question is kind of to maybe zero in on some of the things that, that you previously talked about, but um, you know, we're gonna have to bring all the tools in our toolbox to bear on a global uh, posture, post, posturing um, for um, combating the uh, climate change issues. So from your point of view, for us to lead in this regard, what can we use um, and, as far as development and diplomacy with our partners and allies and friends. And, you know, you mentioned India, I don't know where they fit into that. I also was reading that China is, is digging deep into their coal reserve and plans to do that quite, quite a bit more over the next um, five to 10 years. So that's the question. Well, you know, China is tough because, you know, they're increasingly a um, more difficult competitor, right? But, um, they, they actually are, you know, they have poor air quality. They have limited access to fresh water. Um, they're having des des desertification um, of, of a lot of their arable land. Um, and so they are waking up a little bit. I'd love to work with them to, um, you know, this might be one area where we could actually work together uh, on, on issues. But look, the thing that we can do, and I think this is true, this is something Republicans and Democrats support, is support innovation in energy. You know, so we we know that solar has come a long way. It's become much much cheaper as a result of it, some sustained investment over time. We need to invest in things like direct air capture, hydrogen, uh, next generation nuclear. Um, I, I'd love all, to see all of that be um, be fueled by American investment uh, for the use of the world. And as we think about um, our own self interest and our national security. What's our outreach going to be to Africa, for instance? You know, as Africa develops, as Africa is, is Africa going to be the next major manufacturing place? Well, where's the power going to come from? Let's see it come from. Let's, as a United States uh, foreign policy, let's do energy outreach that really makes sense for for them and for and for the future of the world. So I think that's um, that's kind of how I think of it. I think that there's been some good diplomacy. Um, you know, Secretary Kerry just spoke to the Democratic. Uh, retreat this week. You know, they've got a methane pledge, um, which is good. They're doing some things on hydrofluorocarbons. But I'm what I would like to see is a really much more aggressive energy outreach strategy to make sure that as the rest of the world develops, that they do it around energy sources that literally we can live with. 
All right. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that overview. And uh, yeah. oh, by the way, just let me just mention too, um, LNG might be a part of that mix. That's a big Texas thing. Absolutely. Um, I don't necessarily object to that, but what I've told the industry is, is just make sure that you are not leaking methane. We know that the natural gas burns cleaner than coal, but it can't be a bridge fuel if it's emitting methane because then all the climate benefit goes away. And I think um, people are starting to get that. I will also tell you that in my own travels, I, I had the opportunity to go with Senator Coons on a CODEL where we, uh, we actually visited um, Qatar. Qatar and the United States are the two largest exporters of natural gas. And they went, I was with senators. So of course I was at the end, but no one, they, they all, we're all thanking Qatar appropriately for helping us with, uh, with refugees out of Afghanistan. What do they got to me? I said, I basically asked the Emir, um, what are we doing about uh, methane emissions? And at that point he didn't have an answer. He turns in his native language to the, to the deputy like two or three seats down and yells at him. And he comes back with some pat, pat um, environmental thing. He went to, to to Scotland, boy, they really seem to care about this. But afterward, um, the minister came out to me personally and told, told us that, uh, thank you for the question. And now Qatar has signed the methane pledge. So um, whatever, you know, whenever I have a chance to talk to the, the king of a country, <laughs> I'll do so. But I've spent a lot more time here just trying to talk to the CEO of Occidental and, and, uh, and BP in Texas as well. Thank you for your answer. And talk to Ray Hunt. I mean, he's got algae analysis and all yeah. this weird stuff, you know, that, that to generate uh, um, energy. And like you I'm said, the, um, we, we need all of it. That's we need all of it. All of it. Actually, I'm the, I'm the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Algae Caucus. You didn't know there was one. <laughs> but I would say that if you want a pond scum politician, that's me. You know, there's there's so many solutions out there. And I think that uh, what you're just highlighting right now is 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 always trying to find the common ground. It's like you did with your earlier answer about reaching out to folks here domestically and overseas is just uh, with all of us knowing that this is something that we that we all have to get together on. Uh, I, we've got a question here from Lieutenant General John Regney, and I hope we can bring him up on the screen to ask his question. General, are you uh, are you able to get on screen here with us? We're bringing him up. He's another gentleman from out west here. Oh, I see him. I see his box. General Regney, are you with us? All right, I can I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead and and, uh, and fire away here. Oh, good okay. to see you. Great. Okay, my, my question disappeared. I had typed a very long question. <laughs> Congressman Peters, first of all, thank you for joining us today. I'm particularly impressed that San Diego State just tipped off in their March Madness game, and you're here with us instead of watching it. I'm aware of the yeah. timing, sir. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> my, my question has to do with nuclear power uh, and, and electricity generation. First, as you're well aware, France... 70% of their electricity is generated by nuclear power. China is the fastest growing country with nuclear reactors for their electricity generation. Yet at the same time, several EU countries, particularly Germany, are phasing out their nuclear stuff. And here in the USA, about half of our states have a nuclear reactor for electricity, and then Arizona, where I live, has a huge one. Uh, yet there's probably sentiment against uh, producing more because of some past history and storing nuclear waste and so forth. So I'm, I'm curious that given now that Russia's fossil fuels and their impact to particularly to countries like Germany is now front and center in the news, um, do you think there's going to be a political sentiment uh, to both in the USA and, in, and with our allies to really seriously pursue and accelerate safe, cleaner nuclear power so we can insulate ourselves better from foreign influences and things like that? And is the, would the Congress be on board with something like that for the states to work? Thank you. I, I think increasingly, yes, General. I think, um, you know, I'm in California where we're making it really hard to relicense our plants. And I think Germany's made a mistake. I think, first of all, that's old technology. You may make an argument that you don't want to subsidize the construction of that same technology going forward. You want to do better. But to the extent you've already invested in it, I, I really think we should try to get out of it as much as we can. 
And I think so. So some of this is coming offline too early, I think, to for, you know, for purposes of fighting the climate battle. So the but I do think there's there is a continued interest in next generation nuclear technology, which would generate which would um, burn up more of the of the of the fuel with leaving less spent fuel um, to just be disposed of could be smaller uh, and and literally modular. Uh, and I hear more and more about that. I'm on the energy subcommittee. Uh, and I think that it's sort of, it's sort of an unavoidable answer because um, it's, it's the best base load power, I think probably that we have. And I, also, I think most experts think it's gonna be hard to make our numbers without a big component of nuclear. So um, I'm, I'm for that. I think we, we also ought to be looking at, re, we're gonna be investing in researching whether we can reprocess what we consider now spent fuel to get more out of it. And I would also say that longer term, there's a real effort to uh, pursue fusion. And I keep hearing people say that, you know, that's not 30 years away. It's, you know, it's closer to 10 years away. And obviously that would be, um, you know, it would be a dream technology. It's, I think it's, it's worth pursuing that as well. But I, 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 I certainly agree with the sentiment that uh, nuclear has got to be part of the solution. I don't know how we make our numbers without it. Quick second question. I think the, better, the best example of climate change affecting national security is the Arctic, where, mm -hmm. where Russia has 11 yeah. time zones of the 24 in the Arctic and will now have passages uh, to the Western world that way. Um, the last time I checked, the Coast Guard had two icebreakers right. and Russia has like 40. Right. And uh, so from your committee perspective on energy, uh, is there a push to really fund more icebreaker and other systems we need in the Arctic uh, as that warms up and is now passable? I will tell you, I, I will have to get back to you because I remember the conversation about this in connection with the, uh, the military budget, the NDAA. I thought we were going for four. Uh, it's not 40, but I thought we were, we were trying to, to ramp that up. Um, I, I certainly think there's an awareness of it. Uh, from the military side and a desire to address the concern. Yeah, and you know we, we've opened up a new theater of operations potentially, right. and we haven't funded it and resourced it, let alone know what the requirements are. So with that, I'll say that we need more Air Force in San Diego. And I enjoyed when I was running the Air Force Academy, going into San Diego State and giving you guys a few lessons every now and then. With that, Sean, I'll, I'll air off here. We're a, we're a Navy, Marine, and um, Coast Guard town, but we heard there's an Air Force and an Army. We're aware that they're out there somewhere. <laughs> very good. Thank you, Congressman. All right. General Regney, thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to hear from you. Uh, I've got one question in the chat here from Jessica that I think is really good um, that I wanted to bring up, which is how can Congress work with the administration to shape a global climate resilience strategy that mitigates the most severe impacts of climate change in the US and the developing world. So what's the relationship between Congress and the administration on working on this issue? Well, of course, in foreign relations, um, so much is left to the State Department that is to make policy. And, um, you know, we have a foreign relations committee that, that supports that. I think, um, I think the biggest, the biggest um, contribution we can make in Congress is a commitment to funding it appropriately. You know, when you go around to the State Department, you you know you hear you hear stories about how you know the computer systems are terrible, and you compare that to the um, you know the the amount of money we spend in defense, which you know I've supported every defense budget. Um, there's got to be room to to do more strategic investment, and I think supporting the funding for um, State Department initiatives is really important. And I, like I said, I, I think we should be investing a little bit more in, um, you know, in, in energy security around the world, at both to create alliances and also to mitigate climate change. Um, that's, that's something Congress has got to be on board with. But I, I think that if the administration was interested in it, they get a good response. Sure. And, you know, I think sort of getting to, to what you're talking about uh, in terms of energy independence, I mean, right now we're, we're looking at, you know, possible um, aligning uh, between, you know, China and Russia, talking about, you know, China potentially buying oil from Russia to try, try to shore their economy up. So, you know, China is it's one of these, you know, undoubtedly one of the United States' greatest adversaries right now. And we're often at odds with them uh, over a number of issues. Uh, most recently, the Ch Chinese Communist Party uh, refused to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, although maybe they tamp that down a little bit. Um, however, 
you know, to confront climate change, it's still going to be really important for us to work with China. Yeah. So, you know, how, you know, what does that look like for us? How, how can we continue to stand up to China as, as a competitor on the global stage uh, in terms of, you know, authoritarianism and cybersecurity and human rights while still working together with them on the issue of climate change? Well, I mean, they're not North Korea. They're, they do have an understanding of their own self-interest. They're very, um, well, they're very focused. They're very long-term thinkers. They, they think in the long term, and so I think it's possible to say that they, you know, we we certainly disagree with what they're doing on the Uyghurs, and would love to see more of a response on some of the, you know, some of the, the things that they've done in Hong Kong and and so forth. But I do think that China understands that. Um, as a matter of science, that climate change is a threat for them as well, and we ought to be able, we could be cooperating with um, with them in, in finding alternatives to, to the coal that they have. I, I I just it's just a matter of, of two pretty sophisticated countries recognizing where they have shared interests and um, or, you know, letting letting down the uh, putting down the the fists for that around that one issue. I think it's 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 pretty important, and I I believe I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that we'll both. Both sides will see the the rationality of it. We're also not in a position, you know, when you look at Putin right now, he's he's reached a point of, you know, we're concerned that he's irrational. Um, he's got no resources. He's got no, um, in, many, in many ways, he's he's weak. Um, you know, China won't have that issue. China will be able to, to think for themselves and I think uh, have already taken some steps to clean up their air. And I think there's more, more for them to do. I bet they recognize that. Sure. Uh, you know, sticking uh, international, but coming back over to, to our own hemisphere here, um, you know, you, you're, you're from California and Southern California, so uh, you're, the border is right there. I mean, I mean to what extent uh, do you see migration from Central America to our Southern border um, as, as the result or affected by or driven by climate change to any degree? And if so, are there any changes in environmental policy um, uh, that we can do to help reduce that migration or, you know, more specifically to our discussion here today, what types of aid programs can we implement or strengthen in places like Central America to try to mitigate that uh, and try to make it better for folks to be able to stay home uh, in, in their own countries and make life better for them? By the way, I should have mentioned, you mentioned the other big international imperative, by the way, and you mentioned South America, so it triggered it is a uh, is fighting back on de deforestation, which is something we should be providing incentives to do as well. Um, I had the chance to visit Honduras and it's a complicated place. Um, the, uh, the, I think right now the main driver seems to be you know, the crime that, that people are fearful of. Um, and I, you know, I think in terms of climate change, um, you know, the distribution of water is going to be a real challenge. You know, California's got to think about, right, for, for us, for instance, we know that the Sierras aren't the functional reservoir they were when the snowpack was much higher. Now the snowpack's at 10 or 20 percent of historical levels. Uh, we're going to have to think about how to capture fresh water rather than maybe building pipes from existing fresh water places to the south. Um, that's going to be happening around the the world where, you know, water distribution is going to be sudden and unpredictable. I think, um, you know, figuring out a way for those places to have water will be really important. I think it's going to be a, um, an engineering innovation, a science innovation. That's going to be important in, in West Texas. It's going to be important in, um, in you know, around uh, uh, the Middle East. And I think, you know, those are the kinds of, of things that I think America's American could bring to poorer countries to help them you know, help maintain a habitable place for the people who live there. You know, I, I wish, by the way, that we would get serious about immigration policy, particularly at a time when we have um, such uh, demands for, for workers. We have such, uh, you know, for economic, for purposes of economic growth, it would be good to, to turn in a few more immigrants, but um, it has to be planned and, and we, have, we can't have open borders. Um, so I think a lot of it is continuing to invest in places to make sure that they, they are continuing to be habitable and desirable places to stay. Sure. And, and, you know, you, you touched on, you know, the, the clean water issue, which is so crucial to, uh, to health, obviously. I mean, there's nothing more essential to a human life than water, uh, you know, but sort of along the same lines, you know, failure to address climate change 
can also have widespread uh, and dire global health impacts. I mean, the international or the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change's most recent report found that by 2050, climate change could lead to 250,000 excess deaths per year due to heat, undernutrition, malaria, uh, and, and other diseases. And, you know, also according to the EPA, I mean, temper in increases in, in, you know, Massachusetts have led to increased precipitation uh, and created a more hospitable environment for insects from foreign countries. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's, you know, West Nile virus. So how, how can Congress work with the administration uh, to, to help, you know, address the, the issue of, of global health? And this is a big part of the international affairs budget that we talk here at, at USGLC uh, so often. Yeah, I think the place the place where we all can all agree is is make sure we understand as much as we can about what's happening, uh, and then learn what to do about it. I, you know, a lot of this is, um, you know, having a strategy around around this. You know, just parenthetically, uh, we got to get our own house in order. I um, introduced uh, this year a national climate and adaptation. Re uh, Resilience Strategy Bill with its bipartisan, bicameral. I have uh, Maria Salazar, Republican from Florida, but Senators Chris Coons and Lisa Murkowski. We're the only G20 country without a strategy for resilience, uh, and so this would this would require that to happen. Would would appoint a resilience officer in the White House. Um, I think that we ought to do that here, but certainly we have to do, we have to understand globally too that it's in our interest to make sure we're following what's going on in other places. So. Um, you know, let's get our own house in order. Let's have a resilience and adaptation strategy. Um, that bill, by the way, supported by, I guess it's bipartisan, but the chamber, the bipartisan policy center, environmental defense fund, uh, adaptation professionals, it just makes sense to do that. I think that's the way we should be thinking about uh, a foreign policy response as well. What's happening and what should we do about it? Sure. Basic. Well, Congressman, um, I'm gonna. I got one last question for you here. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tee you up to, to try to close us out on a on maybe a hopeful note. Uh, you know, over the past two years, USGLC uh, has been making the case for why U.S. leadership um, and a global response to climate change matter, both at home and abroad. Uh, we launched a campaign last spring titled "What's It Worth?" Uh, so. I want to know, uh, in terms of climate change, you know, what, in your words, what is it worth in regard to our national security uh, for the U.S. to continue to lead by example at home and globally uh, on, on climate change? What's it worth? Well, you know, boy, if we do this right, it could be really exciting. And, and you know, I think um, you, can, you can get yourself pretty bummed out if you, if you think about what could go wrong and the trajectory we're on. But, but if you can imagine us... Uh, leading the world in developing new energy systems that are cleaner, not only will power our, our homes and our cars, but will make the, you know, stop, stop kids from getting asthma, uh, you know, give us a chance to figure out how to, to really um, help this planet continue to thrive and flourish. I mean, it's, it's a pretty cool project. Um, I, I, I like working on it um, and I, uh, it gets me up every day. There's a, there was an effort to put $500 billion into a number of environmental um, or 300, I think $300 billion as part of the Build Back Better Act, uh, you know, in this, in this Congress into, you know, basically a lot of environmental research and incentives. Um, we're so close to doing that. That could happen if, if uh, Senator Manchin decided uh, how he wanted to, what he wanted to send back to us that we've already approved. I just think there's a lot of opportunity. And like I said, when I went to Lubbock, Texas, um, I heard two things that I, were very encouraging to me, um, that Catherine Hayhoe's classes uh, on, on climate change um, are oversubscribed. She used to just have graduates, graduate, uh, graduate students. Now she's got undergrads clamoring to take the class. Petroleum engineering enrollment is down. Uh, and I think, um, I think there's a growing recognition that this is something we have to deal with, but so much opportunity for innovation and creativity and economic success if we do it right. So um, I am, um, you know, that's, that's kind of what, what keeps me going. You're muted. That's got to happen at least once. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Scott. You're too young for that, by the way. We always like, 
uh, I, I have to turn my camera off for a second to make sure the lights turn on in here. So, uh, cause I'm in the office and they, they, they're, they're motion activated. Um, thank you again for your time here today. Uh, this has been a real pleasure. And I want to thank everybody who uh, has tuned in and for your questions and contributions to this discussion. Um, and uh, for, for all of you, you know, USGLC and Veterans for Smart Power, we're, we're looking forward to, to hopefully getting back out on the road a little bit more this year uh, with, um, you know, hopefully our, uh, the pandemic uh, improving uh, to a certain degree. So uh, lots more coming your way, more like this. And, and again, just want to say thanks to uh, Congressman Scott Peters for joining us, uh, a, a real stalwart. And um, uh, we just appreciate your, your leadership and your thoughts here today, sir. Thanks, Sean. I hope you all be in touch with uh, good ideas for me to work on. I, I, I see a lot in the chat we weren't able to get to, but I really appreciate the chance to talk with you about it and uh, look forward to seeing you again in person. Yes, indeed. Thanks, all. all right.